Hi, everyone. Today, we are talking with Michelle Vinukarov, who is a paraprofessional and RBT autistic advocate. And we are very excited to have her on here. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you so much for having me on here today. Um, we're so excited. I know there was a little bit of back and forth for a couple of months about scheduling you to be on here. So we're glad we finally got to make it work. Um, I'd love for our audience to hear a little bit more about you. Do you want to introduce yourself and kind of what brought you into the field? Absolutely. So for those of you don't for, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Michelle Van Curve. I'm an, I'm a young autistic adult. I was diagnosed with autism at the age of two, and I didn't say my first word verbally until I was six years old. And so during like throughout the process and everything, my parents advocated for me when I was very low and got me early intervention services, such as with speech therapy, applied behavior analysis therapy, which includes ABA therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, you name it. I had it all. I used to have it a mix of all the services seven days a week. And this was when I was growing up a little bit in New York and then continued the services in New Jersey when my when my family and I moved. And then goes on like as life goes on and, and everything, like I was just growing and everything. I used to be that person who would lack eye contact couldn't verbally communicate like in full sentences until I was 10 years old. I struggled with, with chewing. Like I had to literally be taught how to chew because like my, the muscles in my mouth were not connecting to, um, like there was like lack of connection between the nerves in my mouth and my brain. So I had to be taught how to physically taught how to chew. Um, I barely like played with my siblings, which still was at the time my older sister Samantha and my younger brother John. And um and with everything that's going on and stuff that I was growing after I said my first word at the age of six, that's when I was like development developmentally like growing more, where I was gaining a lot more skills. Like I started to be able to handwrite by the time I was at the end of my elementary school years. I was starting to um, have reduced in services. I had ABA therapy until I was eight years old. I had that for a few years. I also the same thing with occupational therapy, physical therapy, like all that was gone by the time I was in like my late elementary school years. And pretty much fast forward in time, I currently today, I am a paraprofessional. I work with students with disabilities I, in the elementary level. I also am happy to share that this year I started working as a RBT. As, and if people don't know that, it's a registered behavior technician who works in the ABA field doing providing therapy to autistic clients. I passed my exam for it back in May of this year, which that was huge. And I've been working as an RBT. I started working as an RBT as of last month. So it's been uh, while I've been on summer break from being a paraprofessional. That's what I've been doing uh, over the summer is providing ABA therapy to autistic clients. And a little bit of my inspiration about that was from my own personal experiences, getting ABA therapy myself. And also that as a paraprofessional, I, in New Jersey, before my family and I uh, moved to Florida, which is where we currently live, I was working in a classroom, in a public school setting classroom that incorporated ABA therapy, which was amazing. So I actually got some experiences of what uh, from the side of where I was at first a client when I was little to now where I was providing therapy hands-on as a paraprofessional in that classroom. And I learned about like so many programs and like data collection methods that um, to use when it comes to uh, collecting progress of, of skills from students and clients. So that's it. it the field is just quite fascinating and like there's so much that has improved. 
Well, wow. first of all, congratulations for Thank passing you. your RBT. Um, mm-hmm. I see the big smile on your face and you're like, yes, I did it. That's amazing. Um, at what age did you realize that you wanted to be in this field? That's a good question. I honestly didn't realize that I truly wanted to be in this field until I started doing the work hands-on in the classroom as a paraprofessional in, uh, in the, in the self-contained classroom that I worked in, in the public school setting. I, the more that I started to see that I was doing so well hands-on, like I helped a child grow from where they were communicating on their AAC device from like a one word sentence to three to four word sentences by the end of the school year. It was huge. Was just How like, rewarding. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah, it really was. Like, I was so proud of like, I was so proud of the child for like, for pushing on and just with me, like incorporating, like encouraging the push of them, like to use their communication because like, People often mistaken about with communication being just verbal, but communication is any form of speech, whatever be from an AAC device to sign language. Like that's the key. Yeah, exactly. As long as they keep their needs met, right? And you're doing that. And that's amazing. That's incredible. Yeah. You had a really interesting journey. It's almost like you're a full circle now giving back to the community. And I'm curious if you can tell us a little bit about your experience. If you remember when you were back to when you were six years old, what it was like receiving AB therapy. I mean, you can't be that old, so it wasn't that long ago, but I'm sure things have changed even in the last few years in terms of what AB therapy looked like. Um, so what was your experience with it? So I will be honest that I have like, actually the more intense ABA therapy was way earlier on. Like as soon as that I was diagnosed, my parents were getting me the services as soon as possible. And I was actually getting services the same year. So the more intense uh, therapy services I had at the age of two, which I don't recall too much per se, but I could definitely share a little bit from my parents' experiences, like of how much they told me about with, um, but I do remember this a little bit at the, at the, at the age of six when in the school setting, I used to get reinforced a lot with NMMs because it was my favorite candy, but I love the fact of how much the field changed in terms of the belief of using food reinforces as the main reinforcer to motivate like clients and students because it, it just, there are foods out there that are not healthy that should not be given per se. And we need to like be realistic about that. And also to expand not only like with reinforces, like just to expand like interest. So yeah. I love like the fact that while I've been working as an RBT, I've actually been helping clients with, with expanding their interests, like with incorporating different like let's say with drawing on the whiteboard, uh, tablet, um, doing puzzles, just expanding all the different uh, options, but giving choices, which I think that's very important when it comes to working in the field. Yeah, that's, no, that's a really good point. Yeah. yeah, I remember when I started out, it was 20 some odd years ago as well. And it was the same thing, you know, it was M&Ms, it was nine o'clock in the morning and it was <laughs> You know, you try and break the M&M up into three or four different pieces. And sure enough, you know, the child's like, I don't want my M&M broken. <laughs> but you're trying to break it up so you don't give as many. But at the same time, it's like, really, you really need to work for food and you need to have it at nine o'clock in the morning and the most unhealthy thing. And, you know, yesterday I actually thought of that because I was at a client's house yesterday and um, I brought, I don't know if anybody knows what a Nana surprise is, but it's like a doll and it's such a great it's fun. Anyways, I brought a couple of Nana surprises with me that were my daughter's. Shh, don't tell her. Um, <laughs> and we had the best time. I was able to play with this client and, you know, she introduced her to what a Nana surprise was. We played with them. We changed them. So we're working on some fine motor skills with addressing of them. Um, but we were working on conversation throughout. And I just thought, how great is ABA therapy in the fact that it has grown away from good job. You played with my doll. Here's an M&M to, Hey, like let's make playing with this doll really fun because it can be and the interaction between us is really fun. So, and I, as a therapist yesterday left there going, 
what a fun session. Instead of being like, oh, I've got M&Ms all over my hands and yeah, it was fine. But, you know, it was like, I felt amazing all night because I had fun too, right? Exactly. It's it's about making those sessions like a lot of fun. And I, I feel like what's really important for RBTs and behavior analysts is like just to be yourself because like to have, make it fun. Like I... Like with me, I've been working with clients for almost like, yeah, it'll soon be a month now, but I, um, I try to make the sessions a lot of fun, not just using like the classic, like, you know, with the cards and everything, like, like with DT, with DTT, but also like mixing in, like incorporating like games in a way that do work on the skills at the same time. Like I had my one of my clients the other day that I was working with them this weekend. We actually were playing Connect Four, and I was teaching them like with colors. I was teaching them with taking turns and everything, and you know that way, like a lot of skills are incorporated while making it like play purpose. You bet, and you're having fun as well. You know, yeah. sometimes I mean, I think no. you know. In the ABA field, flashcards are sometimes inevitable, and you have to use flashcards sometimes, and you have to, you know, have, you know, teach people to sit at a table. But you're right; it doesn't have to be boring. You know, I'm a naturally goofy person, and you know, I throw in a whole bunch of like silly things, and you know, try and even teach people about joking and sarcasm, which can be tough um, for a lot of individuals. But you know, teaching them a bit about joking, but also just being a natural goof. Um, and some therapists will come in and watch me and say, "Oh, wow, you make it look so fun." Or you make it look so interesting. And uh, I'm like, I'm just doing that for me. Like I'm actually selfish. Like I just need to like switch this up for me because I want to have fun doing my job as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so you've had, you know, experience both as an RBT, you know, doing now the one-to-one and also in a, in a classroom um, for students with disabilities, what do you see in terms of ABA in both settings? You know, how are they different or what are your experiences comparing the two? That's a very good question. And even just over uh, the past month, like as not even like from besides my paraprofessional job, I've been in the schools, but even my role as an RBT, I I actually been working in the school setting during ESY and I've been doing home. So it's like uh, when it comes to the school setting, like you're, it's, again, it's another um another environment that, you know, where therapists have to come in and like, what's nice is that in the school setting that where the, where your the students slash client is able to interact with their peers and their teachers and everything. And you can definitely generalize a lot more of the skills. And this goes into the same thing with the home setting, the home setting, like uh, the home setting, I felt like I needed to figure out a little bit more with structure in terms of like where to work with the client and like, you know, and the parents are by like sometimes the parents will be right there observing or they'll be just around in the house and stuff to make sure that everything's going OK, because I know with parents, it's understandable being protective and just making sure things go well and everything for their child and we all can get that so i um but either way i think i think the key thing that in order for sessions to do well is pairing and i really believe that so much and i always start the beginning of my sessions with pairing because that way that way the um the client knows that like you're that they'll work hard with you and you're working hard for them so it just It goes back to that. And like from my role as a paraprofessional, I actually now you can bring more insight into what for teachers, what they should be doing and for their that way they can uh, manage behaviors in in the classroom, which is I I definitely have a lot that I will be bringing back once I go back in the school year in August, because that's when the school year starts here again. Yeah, Yeah, that's a valuable skill set for sure in a classroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Um, you're really, you know, between all your roles, getting as much impact as you can, it sounds like, which is amazing. Um, you know, there's a lot out there. I'm sure you've heard of it. I know a lot of parents who maybe have a child newly diagnosed who are 
trying to like figure out what the best approach is and are hearing, you know, both sides of ABA, the people who are pro ABA, the people who are anti ABA, you know, there's a lot out there and it's hard to really, if you're not familiar with it, sift through all the information. Um, what would you say to a parent, uh, someone who experienced ABA and as someone who, you know, trying to dispel some of those myths, is there anything that you would say to them to, you know, try to clarify what ABA really is or why they should, you know, use it for their child? So I would tell to a parent that like with ABA, it's going to only help your child grow in terms of their skills and learn how to how to adapt in the environment while they can still be themselves. There's that big myth that that's out there that like ABA changes like how autistic people should be and stuff and don't let them be themselves. But that's not true at all. As a matter of fact, like we actually are trying to teach like so many different responses. We're not just teaching one straight up response, like how, how I feel like that's the thing that evolved a lot in the ABA field is the fact that like, we're actually accepting more different responses of how a client should, how a client can interact in the environment, like teaching so many different ways of, you know, and that comes in the, like through shaping and, you know, and everything. So it just, I, for parents, like, just so you know that like ABA really, I know for me personally, it helped me so much from when I was little and I felt like I learned a lot and just a mix of like other resources too, which is important as well, because I know for me, I needed more than, I needed another, uh, all other therapies new too, and not just ABA therapy. So like Having those collaborations is really important for your own child's success. And I, you know, a lot of people, why they like, there's a lot of those anti like ABA people. The reason for that is like, a lot of it has to do with like the facts from the past and not really focusing on what's the information that's out there now. People are so focused on mindset of the past that they're not thinking of what's going on presently and how much it's changed overall in the, uh, in the picture. So that's what we have to like really just focus mm -hmm. more now than than before. Yeah, that's such a good point. And I don't think people realize like any parent who like toilet trains their child, like that's ABA. Anyone <laughs> who, you know, sleep trains or does any kind of, you know, reinforcement system uses the Starbucks rewards points, you know, yeah. all of that is ABA. And I think people have, like you said, this, this memory from the past of like 30 years ago, what was going on and are not really realizing how many benefits there are and how much we actually use it in our everyday lives. And there's so many different applications and styles. And if you don't want the DTT, then there's other options out there, but to throw out the whole field, um, because of, you know, some sort of myth, I think is a shame. So I agree with you. I also think what happened 20 years ago, not even just about ABA in general, um, but just just our vernacular, right? Our words and what we say, you know, 20 years ago, you know, we weren't accepting of anything. And, you know, our society has come so far in terms of saying, you know, acceptance, not for autism, but just for everything in general, right? We're more accepting of so much. And, you know, there are so many things from 20 years ago that we want to say, oh my gosh, like that should never have been said. That should, like, um, you know, you read a book from 20 years ago and you go, wow, I can't believe they use that vocabulary. And, you know, not only has that changed, the ABA field has evolved as well. And I think people need to realize that, that, you know, I'm sure it has happened that 20 years ago, they got that ABA therapy. I have no doubt that that happened and I feel horrible for them. And, you know, I'm sure that there were some service providers 20 years ago who were out to quote unquote change people and do change therapy, conversion therapy, however they want to look at it. Um, but for parents now, I would say that's not ABA at all. We're not out to 
change someone. If anything, we're out to enhance their quality of life in terms of communication skills. You know, like you said, you taught somebody to go from, you know, communicating with, you know, pressing one button to communicating with whole phrases on an augmentative communication device. And, you know, that's not changing their personality. If anything, it's enhancing their quality of life because now, you know, their thoughts and ideas can, you know, get out of their head and, you know, onto a device so that they can be heard finally. And that's really what ABA or as ABA therapists we're striving to achieve. Exactly. We're like the field is adapting to how much like society has been changing. And that's what's great about with this field is that we're always growing. And that's with everybody. I know with me right now, like I've also been a college student. I attend online, fully online for my bachelor's degree in psychology with concentration in ABA through Purdue University Global. And I am graduating in October. So I um, (laughs) am very excited about that. I'll be able to pursue for um, by going for becoming a BC ABA. So that would be amazing. But, um, But yeah, the fact that just like, of how much the field has been changing and adapting with what society has been changing as well for all, all these years. So it's just, it's been wonderful about that. And I, and I want families and communities to know that, like that the, of how much the, that the field has been changing with society too. And you also mentioned the importance of taking a multidisciplinary approach. You know, you mentioned that not only did you get ABA therapy when you were young, but you also got OT and PT, so occupational therapy and physical therapy and and speech therapy as well. And that's huge. And I know that, you know, way back, I keep going when I first started, but, you know, you know, we had blinders on or many of us had blinders on and it was just ABA. ABA is the best way. And that's it. And I just from working in the field as well, like I see the difference. And, you know, when I'm working with a speech pathologist or I'm working with an occupational therapist or a physiotherapist, it's so nice to be able to incorporate other people's ideas and enhance the therapy. Um, can you tell us a little bit about whether you incorporate any of those roles into the into your classroom environments or anything like that? So I have actually um the funny thing is that like over the past school year, I'll actually share this from my in the habit of being a paraprofessional that like, I've actually, for, I work one-to-one with a student and who's not autistic, but uh, no matter what, regardless of what any disability, like I was collaborating like with their, with their occupational therapist, with their physical therapist. So that way I'm incorporating the, the techniques that they were using for my student. And I was actually doing it with them in the classroom. So that way they're, generalizing the skill like for example with uh with handwriting like how to hold a pencil so that way they know how to write uh neatly or with um with walking like helping them with because I know with the student that I work with they use a they use a walker to help them with walking so like I actually am helping them with shaping in terms of their uh with the way that they're walking so they could walk nicely and everything even though they have like the support of leg braces, but yes, I am helping them with, with, uh, with their walking abilities so they would improve and everything. And it definitely helped me out a lot the past school year because my student at first did not even step onto the field at all. And this is a kid that, you know, that was, um, this student just had a lot of, um, they had a lot of doubts, but, helped them overcome it by encouragement and like just to be supportive and patient towards them and like shaping all the all the steps of towards like going on the field and going to play and by the end of the school year this past school year they were playing with friends and and everything it was just wonderful I was like I this is what happens when I learn you uh when I was learning from others and being open and that's what RBTs and behavior analysts need to be is open with others uh perspectives from different disciplines i like that i like that idea a lot be open and sure Mm -hmm. you can still use the techniques of aba in terms of shaping and chaining (laughs) and you know taking data sure data you know take data on the stuff that you're on and measure etc etc but i love it be open i love that 
Is that what you would say to, you know, we have a large audience of newly minted BCBAs or people new in the field. What would be your message to them? Would that be it? Or do you have anything to add? Uh, Mainly like for them to be open with in terms of collaborating with other disciplines to help with their clients. And also the fact that like, just with being themselves, because a lot of times like with autistic people, especially with the myth about with those who are nonverbal, just they can't verbally communicate. That doesn't mean that they're not listening or if they're not showing eye contact directly, that doesn't mean they're not uh, listening. Just know that like they are listening to you and like just be yourselves towards them and like make the make the sessions a lot of fun. Yeah, totally. Um, I mean, that came up for us. We train very, very young staff lately who are starting to get involved in the field. And I think one of the things that they don't realize is that communication, just because somebody can't speak doesn't mean they can't communicate. And it sometimes leads to, you know, them talking about them in their presence. And so really emphasizing the new next, you know, generation of people that communication goes both ways. You know, our clients are people, we don't talk about them in front of them and, you know, understanding that all communication is communication, giving them as many opportunities as they can um, to communicate, I think is a great message. Um, Thank you. And you've been, you know, living ABA, it sounds like since you were two years old, which is, which is pretty unique. Are there any um, ABA principles that you still use in your life that you still incorporate? I know for me, I'm a very visual learner and it's different for everybody that's on the spectrum. Like you'll have people who are visual learners. You'll have people who are, who learn hands-on and everything. And I'm kind of a mix of that. So like, like when it comes to AV, my own life, like I literally like have a whiteboard and I do a checklist for myself to make sure that I'm getting everything done. Cause I do, I do a lot. <laughs> so, that's a great strategy. Yeah. Or even using the calendar on my phone. So I know like what's coming up and everything. I mean, I think we all do that, don't we? <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking so. about that. I couldn't live without my calendar. I've got my checklist right here, my <laughs> handwritten, because I like the whole idea of taking the pen and checking things off, but I still have yeah. my to-do list. And mm-hmm. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, for anyone else who wants to find out more about you, can you share where you're at, your website? Absolutely. So for those of you that want to follow my professional accounts online, you could follow me at Exceptional Shell. You, my username is at self, self advocate MV. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, TikTok, you name it. I also, you can also follow and subscribe to my blog website, The World of Autism, which I'm happy to share that that's been going on for a couple of years now. And I've had like, I share experience of being on the autism spectrum myself to education about with like with my roles as a paraprofessional I provide information like about with IEPs and with and important things about in the school system to ABA therapy from being an RBT and a college student so I you can definitely follow and subscribe to that and also see my own guest podcast series that I have on there too. Excellent. So the world of autism um, and exceptionalshell.com. And that'll all be in the show, in the show notes as well. Perfect. Yeah, And I think it's such a valuable resource for us as BCBAs or anyone who, you know, we need to hear voices of people who have different experiences or who come from a background where they, you know, are autistic or have received ABA therapy. And I think we as a field need to hear their voices a little bit more. So thank you for providing that resource for us. Um, which sounds like, you know, a really, really important place that everybody should check out. Thank you. And I'm glad. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you so much, Michelle. 